Welcome everyone to the first ever all digital technology coaching conference. We're so excited to be hosting the, this event and can't wait for a great day of content. I wanted to kick it off with a little bit of a story. So last week at Dino, we were working together um, and really over communicating on how we were going to operate moving forward as a business with all of these changes in the current climate. and as we were preparing for our changes on how we best serve our customers moving forward, I began to receive a lot of emails and a lot of tweets from attendees of this conference asking, is the technology coaching conference still happening? Um, and I was, we were quick to respond to all of those and letting everyone know that, yes, it's still happening. It was supposed to be a digital event all along. Um, and then the part that really hit me were the responses we began to hear, hear back from all of you. Things like our professional development um, for Friday got canceled and our team is really looking forward to joining this, this conference to fill the void and learn a lot. Um, sentiment like, hey, this is gonna be a really great distraction during this period. I've been trying to operate with two kids in the background and I'm excited to learn. Um, we're honored to um, be able to facilitate and play that role for all of you um, today. I know there's a lot of people that are new to the Dino audience that are attending this event, and this is not going to be all about Dino, but I do want to let introduce who Dino is to the audience. Um, we're a company that believes strongly in building collaboration between teachers, tech coaches, and tech admins in K-12 education. We're also a solution that brings these stakeholders together to defeat student device distraction, maximize student learning, and support your e-learning programs right now. So a little bit about why we are hosting this conference. We have spent the last 12 to 18 months um, in a lot of conversations with our teachers, with admins, and learning about how these people within K-12 schools and districts are building collaboration internally. And through our conversation, something that rose to the top was this role, the technology coaching role. And it was a role that we were, as a company, missing when we were talking to the market. But it was a company that was so um, important in all of these conversations we were having. What we learned is that these are newer roles. They're helping bridge the gap between the tech admin and the teacher and helping make sure that uh, technology that is um, put in the classroom is being used effectively for both the teachers and students. We learned that there's a min many different titles for technology coaching. I'm sure there's hundreds of titles from different people that are attending today's conference. And finally, we learned that this role feels like they're on an island. Um, they're trying to figure it out since it's a new newer role and they don't have a lot of resource resources as they're trying to learn on the fly. Today, our intention is to eliminate that, be a source to give you content and give you some um, inspiration that you can leverage moving forward. I'll also state that this conference is not just about the technology coaching role. This, this, this conference is for teachers, this conference is for principals, this conference is for admins, you name it. If you are responsible for working internally with different stakeholders, developing collaboration, building communication, this is the type of conference for you. The second part is integrating the technology. Really the core of this conference is for all of those individuals within schools or districts who work every day to communicate, to drive really great results for your um, students. The presenter list is out of control. I'm so excited to um, learn today, just like all of you sitting at home in your home office or wherever you may be. Um, I'm going to turn it over to my teammate, Tierra, who's been really responsible for quarterbacking this entire event and process. And I'm sure a lot of you out there, and I, I know specifically our presenters have worked uh, with her um, leading up to this. So sit back, relax. Hopefully you can get something today, one nugget that you can take for this next semester and apply, or hopefully something you learn that you can leverage today in your remote learning environment. Tierra, I'll pass it over to you. Thanks, Brett. Good morning, everyone. Um, as Brett said, um, I've kind of organized most of this conference, so you've probably received um, several emails from me. Um, 
telling you about the conference, giving you some information over the past few months. Um, we're really excited for all of you to join us today. Um, I think it's going to be a great day. We've already received a few questions this morning about um, just what the schedule is going to look like. So I wanted to give you all an overview of that, as well as set up some expectations for what you, you can expect today during the conference, as well as after the fact. So we have a great schedule lined up today, as Brett said. Um, Monica Burns will be kicking it off at 10 a.m. in just a few minutes. Um, and then we have four other presentations spanning the range of instructional strategies. Um, we have Chuck Holland, who's actually a Dino customer, who will be talking about um, how he coaches his large team of, team of technology coaches with his coworker, Nikki. Um, we have Caleb, who's gonna be talking about, you know, personality and tech coaching and how to figure out what your teacher's personality type is so that you can effectively coach them um, going off of that personality type. And then we're gonna wrap it up with a very applicable, um, a uh, presentation from Matthew and Scott, who are hosts of the TNT EdTech podcast. Um, they're going to be talking about how to leverage your support network, um, both through social media and your local PLC, which is, you know, very applicable at this time as the technology and education landscape is really shifting before our eyes right now. Um, so we're really excited for this great day of sessions. Um, if you can't make it to all the sessions, don't worry. Um, we will be sending you the recordings after the fact. So we understand if you have to jump out, take care of your kids, take care of your students. Don't feel like you need to spend your whole day with us. We will have all of the recordings for you afterwards. Um, so going off of that, just to set up a few expectations for today, as I mentioned, the the going to be the live recorded. Um, it'll be made available to everyone who registered for the event. So even if you registered, couldn't attend live, you'll still be getting the five hour recording. Um, we also use the Q&A tool. I've already noticed some attendees are taking advantage of that, asking me some questions. So feel free to ask me questions about um, just the conference in general throughout the um, conference, as well as asking presenters um, questions regarding their presentations. Um, we will be giving about 10 or 15 minutes after each presentation to answer a few selected questions from that Q&A tool. Um, so go ahead, ask your questions. They're definitely getting read by us and we will answer as many as we can. Um, the one thing that's kind of missing in a virtual conference is that you know, discussion and peer connection part of a live, live event. So we really wanted to create a space for all of you to connect as attendees and with our presenters. Um, so we ask that you use the hashtag TechCoachCon, which a lot of you have already been utilizing before the conference. But if you have thoughts on different presentations, things you'd like to share, um, questions you want to ask our presenters, go ahead, use that hashtag. Um, this is the only thing that's being talked about in there. So there's a wealth of knowledge in there. And we'd love to hear your discussion and contribution to um, the different topics that are going on today. Hey, hey, Tierra. Yes. Um, so I, the tech coach con hashtag using that on Twitter, I was sitting here thinking about it and I'm, I definitely get excited when I can go back and look at all the great conversation that's happening via Twitter and the hashtag. So I, we have not talked about this, but I'm going to say it right now. We will pick one individual who uses the tech coaching con hashtag for a giveaway that's gonna definitely help you out during this time of being in probably a remote learning environment. The details on that are unclear because I just thought of it, but we're gonna do a giveaway. So again, that should be extra motivation to use the Tech Coach Con hashtag on Twitter. Yes, and we can, that'll be a source of truth for this conference, which will be, which will be awesome. Um, lastly, I got a lot of questions from people if, you can get PD credit for this conference um, if we'll be providing a certificate of attendance. The answer is yes. We will give everyone who attends the live conference a certificate of attendance where you can select which sessions you attended, um, fill in your name there, and then see if you can get PD credit for it through your district or school. Um, additionally, if you couldn't attend live and if you're watching the recording, um, please reach out to us and we'd be happy to provide you with a certificate. We just want to make sure that you've um, actually watched a portion of it before we provide that to you. Um, so without further ado, um, our keynote presenter today is Monica Burns. We've done a decent amount of work with Monica um, in 2019. And so we were really excited to reach out to Monica for 
this uh, conference and to get her to kind of keynote this conference, kick it off. I know she has some really, really great insight onto into what's happening today um, in the education landscape. So um, Monica, I would like to introduce you. I'm gonna go ahead and stop sharing my screen. I hope everyone can see us okay. Um, and Monica, I'm, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Um, I'm gonna take a step back, but feel free to ask any questions, everyone. All right, well, can you see me and hear me all right? I can see and hear you, hopefully. Oh, okay, perfect. Yeah, and I'm sure other folks can, can say that too in the chat. I'm gonna go ahead and share um, my screen. Um, let's meet this a little bit bigger and just give me a, a shout out and interrupt me <laughs> if you can't see anything um, as I'm sharing my screen here. I've got the title slide up for our 10 ways coaches can support teachers with tech integration. And I am really excited to kick off uh, this special event. As you heard, it's been on the calendar for some time. And so we're really excited to have a virtual option today and so we're more folks um, jumping in. And so for my session this morning, I'm going to share with you some ways that coaches can support teachers with tech integration. And anytime I give a presentation, whether you've seen me live at a, a workshop or event or conference, or you've joined a webinar with me in the past, or even if it's your first time today, either way, right? No matter any time I share resources, I always like to make sure there's a landing page or a special spot so that you know that although you can snap a picture, take a screenshot, hopefully send out a bunch of tweets of things that resonate with you or get your wheels spinning. If you head to classtechtips.com slash techcoachcon, it's not case sensitive, so you can type it in all lowercase or all uppercase, and it'll work for you. Um, you'll see a Google form there. You tell me your best email and I will send you out the resources for today. What I'm also going to do is during um, this session, so if you joined in and you fill out that form on my website, um, I'm going to do a giveaway for a copy of my book, 40 Ways to Inject Creativity into Your Classroom with Adobe Spark. So if you fill out that form while you're watching today, you'll automatically get entered into that giveaway and I'll send a, an email out with the resources um, later today. Uh, that way you'll know who the winner is and you'll have everything um, from my session um, in your inbox. So if we haven't met before, my name is Monica Burns. I am a former classroom teacher. I taught in New York City public schools for a number of years, and I've been out of the classroom for several years um, doing some embedded coaching, working one-on-one -on -one, uh, with teachers, demo lessons in classrooms, writing and sharing all things education technology. And so I'm excited to share some things today that have both that teacher and coaching hat on. So hopefully you'll get some ideas and some takeaways that you can bring back into your own practice. Now, I hope and you heard about the hashtag um, that you'll share some of your favorites from today. Um, if you are someone who is on social, you might have followed along with me as well, where I share lots and lots of favorites. But today we're going to kind of narrow it down into a listicle of sorts with 10 ways that you can really support your teachers in a, in a few different areas when we talk about best practicing for coaching. Now, before we jump into the list, we have a few questions for you. I know Tara is going to push out the poll uh, for us just so that we can learn a little bit more about who you are with us today. Um, and so you should kind of see those come out uh, to you. Let's see. All right, I know, um, and Terry, you can give me a shout out if that's uh, working for you because I know it's coming from your end there. So I just pushed out the poll. Perfect. I am hoping everyone's seeing it on their end. Um, if you're not, please chat into Q&A and let me know. Okay, awesome. So we'd just love to learn a little bit more about you, kind of your um, experience in a coaching role or your interest in a coaching role or in some of the ways that you are using technology right now. And maybe Tira, as those results um, come in, you can just kind of give a, a shout out or, or share a little bit of, of what you're seeing there on your screen.
All right. So am I uh, good to jump back in or do you want to share a little bit some of the, the poll responses? Go ahead and jump back in, Monica. For some reason, the poll is not showing up. I'll try to okay, cool. mess with it. No and worries. Sorry about that. No worries. Yeah, I just want to make sure that I'm not um, pausing too long if something is 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 there for us. Okay, yeah. So let's go ahead and jump um, back in. So as we go through, and you heard, um, you know, this kind of piece come up already. Um, when we're talking about what we're going to cover today, I'm going to look at five big areas for you. And so the ways that we'll look at on our list of 10 will kind of go in and out of these big ideas. So today we'll talk about the importance of collaboration in your special role as a coach. We'll talk about why creating channels of communication is really essential. And I'll share some strategies to set up some norms for just that. So the communication piece, the general coaching piece. We'll talk a little bit of about what to do when buy-in is limited. So when folks are a little hesitant, um, how you can help support them when it comes to using technology in different ways. And then we'll look at some uh, digital tools that will help you connect with teachers and hopefully expand upon some of the things that are already in your tool belt when it comes to ways to foster those connections. Now, before we jump into the list, and you heard Brett mention this as we kicked off this morning, this is definitely a trying time for you know, all of us, right? Regardless of your role, there's a lot going on in the world today. And as we talk about these ways to support teachers with tech integration, you most likely are not, you know, in a school right now, right? These things are happening remotely. Your role is shifting. Expectations are kind of moving around, right? We don't know if that's going to be a very short term, just a few weeks or very long term. And some folks know already or have a sense of what their next few months will look like. And for some folks, that's pretty uncertain. So I hope that as we go into our list of ways today, um, and you'll hear me make a few different tweaks of things you might consider if you're in a remote environment right now that you're taking these in and you're making some decisions on what's going to be the best fit for you right now depending on this evolving um, role and situation that you're in right now as well as some things that you'll want to pull into uh, your work you know into the new school year as well so let's go ahead and jump into our list of 10 ways to support teachers with tech integration i'll pause a couple times as we go through to take us out online and demo some strategies with some online tools um, that you may already use or might be new to you and if you have questions um, feel free to put them in that q a and of course if you have an idea or something you want to add on to or something that grabs your attention make sure to use the hashtag for today's event and share on social. So the first one on the list is a classroom takeover. We talk about this idea as a coach supporting teachers with a classroom takeover. What can this look like? So it starts off with identifying a pain point and at knowing what a request might be from a teacher. So if they're coming to you and they're saying, this is something I'm really struggling with, or you're hearing um, them mention something and you can kind of turn it into, okay, this is an obstacle um, that you're facing, identifying that from the beginning. Then modeling a lesson and finding teachable moments. So when I say the word classroom takeover, we're not talking just yet about this idea of team teaching or something where the boundaries aren't quite established. If you haven't team taught with someone else before, you know sometimes um, co-teaching, right? It can be a balance that evolves over the course of the school year. So in this case, you're modeling a lesson and finding those teachable moments right within it. So when something goes wrong, right, modeling what your classroom management strategies might be, um, leveraging some of the routines that are already in a classroom, right, and taking over with that goal of using a pain point or a request that's come in, modeling that lesson and embedding those teachable moments to show how you might tackle something that is an obstacle for that particular teacher. You can then set expectations for what a follow-up would look like, and this can definitely incorporate some team teaching. So now that someone has seen you take over, use the strategy for digital learning that 
goes along with the pain point that that teacher has shared with you, then you can set expectations for what it would look like for a team teaching style follow up. You can debrief, right, and make that plan um, to move forward. So when we talk about coming in and demoing a lesson and supporting a teacher by showing them what it might look like to put a digital strategy um, into action, whether it is something that they've asked you for specifically with a clear request or it's a pain point that they've shared in a more casual conversation that you can turn in to this sort of environment. You have an opportunity to model the lesson and find a teachable moment where then you can share with them. This is something that I didn't anticipate, right? Here's how I acted in the moment. And then you can pull this into follow-ups that not just have a debrief conversation, but also set expectations for what's gonna happen next, which can include a following up with team teaching. The next one on our list is a little bit more lighthearted, and you might have seen this or might do this already in your school. And the term I hear often to describe this um, type of in the moment professional learning or posters with some clear tips is potty PD. And the idea here is that you are posting some sort of information in a space that everyone uses pretty regularly, right? Staff bathrooms, especially, although you might transfer this to a staff workroom or a staff lunchroom. Now, typically this is in poster form. So maybe it is within um, a bathroom right above of the sink where someone is washing their hands and reading this at the same time or over the hand dryer where someone is drying their hands and reading um, a quick poster or note and the key here is to have one actionable piece of information so something that is one clear tip you might do this twice a month so switch it up um, every two weeks or so or you might do it monthly and the key here is to use a clear template right so that you do not have to create something or design something brand new from scratch um, every month or every two weeks but that you have that clear um, call to action alongside your actionable piece of information so when I talk about something that's actionable it means you could try this right away and when we talk about it being monthly or bi-monthly there's a level of consistency and expectation there and then having a clear call to action, what happens there is we're saying, now that you know this, here's what you can do. And so in order to show you how to quickly create one of these, I wanted to go out and take you on a demo of how to do this within Google Slides. Um, the reason that I chose Google Slides as the one to show you what this might look like in action is because with Google Slides, not only can you easily create a template, copy right you can also then export as a pdf for easy printing and then you can also share a link to your total uh, collection of these resources so that if someone's thinking back to what they saw in the bathroom a month before they know where to go to find out uh, exactly what that is so i'm going to come back out here and you should see on my screen i'm going to pop over to um, my Google Drive. I'm already in here and I created a new uh, presentation. So this is just a regular old um, Google Slides presentation. I'm going to go ahead and X out my themes for now as much as I love themes. And just to show you how to put this quick tip into action, I'll often go to page setup. So if you look right now, my Google Slides defaulted into widescreen, which is great if I'm giving a presentation. But if I go to file and page setup, I can actually make this a custom size and I can make this so it is um, eight and a half by 11 inches so that it's going to be the same size as the paper that I might print out with my information. You could do this in PowerPoint. You could do this in Keynote as well. Um, but here we're looking at it just within slides because then you have that quick shareable link and you might even make this collaborative if you're working with another coach. So the idea here is that you would create one as your template and then duplicate it over the course of the school year. So mine's gonna be a little bit more bland for today, just for the sake of um, speedy <laughs> speediness and getting us through a bunch of different tips today. But imagine you have your one clear action item that you wanna share. So you might say something like, have you ever heard of Flipgrid? And then your clear kind of, here's what you could do with it, or you might explain exactly what it is. This video response tool is used in lots of classrooms at our school. And then you might below, and I'm gonna go ahead and just change up my alignment here, put some ideas here. So you might say some ways like 
video exit, tickets, book club with partner, school, or goal setting. And so you can create a poster like this. Now mine again is a little bland here, but you might put your school logo down here. You might put a border and school colors. And then every time you want to make a new one, you can go here to duplicate slide and change it up. So it follows the same consistent format within your template. So I'm going to go ahead here and put our potty pd up here now if i want to share this with teachers right i can go to the share link here get a shareable link and share it so that they can view it within our organization but more likely than not i'm going to start off by going to file download as a pdf and then i have something that i can maybe laminate uh, maybe just print out right and put up in a space where everyone is going to see it so when we talk about this idea of having a clear call to action you can use a template so you don't have to create something brand new each month and you might even right bring this to a group and say what are some things that are working really well for me you just give me one big thing and then turn it into posters that you use over the course of the year now you today might be connecting with someone who works in a school very far away from you right but you have a similar role you might say hey let's team up I'm gonna make 10 you're gonna make 10 and then we'll switch them out and then you both have 20 that you can use right over the course of the school year. Our next way that um, coaches can make sure that they are supporting teachers over the course of the year is through customized communication. And so when we talk about customizing the communication, um, you can leverage existing channels that you already have in place. So if you are already using a certain type of way of communicating with your colleagues, whether it's Microsoft Teams, right, or you are using a different format that models what your students might use in terms of a system uh, for them sharing their learning or you can set up needed channels so you might decide that your your kind of customized communication plan is one that goes along with the channels you already have set up or if you don't have something set up you might decide that you're going to set up some needed channels perhaps you set up something that is more of a one-way where you're pushing out information like quick remind text messages that go out and share information about what to bring for an upcoming meeting or what type of support you're offering or what your office hours look like that month or it might be something that's more two-way and we'll talk a bit about that as we um, continue on our list. You might also decide that you want to set up calendar reminders um, with action items too. So when we talk about customizing the way you communicate with folks, that idea of pushing out information might not be the best or you might not have a channel for communication set up just yet. Instead, you might have Outlook calendars, Google calendars, or something where you are not just reminding someone about a meeting, that you have some action items that go along with it, right? We are meeting today to talk about this, make sure to bring this, or you might set up a reminder that goes the day before you have a one-on-one -on -one meeting with the teacher, um, and that way they can kind of get a heads up that that's what you're gonna talk about tomorrow so that they can pull together the resources that they might want for their meeting. The idea here, no matter what platform you're using, so whether you are using communication channels that are already in place, like posting something in Microsoft Teams, setting up new channels, like pushing out reminders um, with something like Remind, or you are having a reminder on a calendar with an action item that goes out a day or two days before a set meeting, being consistent, whatever platform you choose is a great way to make sure people have a level of expectation, right? And kind of this pattern that goes on um, with the communication that works best for your group. As we keep moving through, one of my favorite tools, um, one of my favorite tips, I should say, to use, um, no matter what type of communication you decide that you're using, are canned responses. Now, canned responses, if you haven't used them before, are kind of like a default. You can think of them as if you had a frequently asked question page and you get emails over the course of the week and you say to yourself, what is the thing that I'm constantly writing in response? What is it that I'm always getting asked about and how can I turn that into one paragraph, two paragraphs that I can then use in a response all the time, um, no matter who the person is, because they basically are asking me the same information. So what you do when you want to set up canned responses is identify your most frequent responses. If you haven't tried this before, what I 
um, would suggest that you do to get started is you have a document set up on your computer, maybe it's a Google Doc, and anytime an email comes in and you realize that you've written the same response to an email like this before, you write that email to the person and then you copy and paste whatever it was that you wrote into the Google Doc. So identifying your most frequent responses. Now you could use this Google Doc style strategy or some tools, Google um, or Gmail, for example, has an add-on for canned responses where you can do a drop down and just click whichever response you wanna plug in. So the idea here is you are saving yourself time. You've been really thoughtful about what your response is to a frequently asked question or to something that you typically have to respond to um, with some sort of regularity. And that way you're not writing something quick where you might leave something out. You have exactly all the details you want and you're saving yourself some time. You can personalize this prepared content though. So it doesn't have to be kind of you, the computer responding to someone. You can use this as the core of your message and still have that same personalization, whether you're maybe asking, oh, how did everything go with um, whatever it was you were doing last week, or so glad you reached out, I was just thinking of you because, right, you can add in that personalization piece that we know is so important for relationship building, but then make sure the core of your information, you're not retyping the same paragraph three or four times a week, you have that prepared content. What's great about this, whether you do it in a document and you copy and paste, um, or you do this as an add-on, um, as a, add on to your email service is that you can update and revise these as needed. So it's not like you are stuck with one response you can continue to update and revise um, as needed. Now, I often do this in a Google Doc. What I'll do is I'll do a header above the email, like what kind of header is this? And then I will set up almost a table of contents. And that way um, I can go to the very top, I can click that hyper, that linked um, table of contents, go to the response that matches the one I need, and I can plug that in really easily. So not only does it save me time, right, if I am responding to someone or save you time if you're getting a lot of the same questions come in, but you can make sure that that response you're giving is going to be of the highest quality. It's not something you're answering quick on your phone. It's not something you're trying to get out before the end of the day, right? You have a really great step-by-step -step or a response, whatever it might be, that meets the need of your particular group. Now, as we keep moving through, you might decide that the way you want to start supporting your teachers is through online resource boards. And if you are a tech coach, if you are gathering lots of resources to share with teachers, you might have a spot online already that you point them to to say, here's where you get this information, or here's a collection of really great resources. So an online resource board could be formatted like a frequently asked question with resources. So if you are struggling with this question, here's all the things that you might need in order to help you answer it. Or if you often get questions about where those virtual field trips are that you talked about at a professional development last summer, you might have an online resource board with all the links right there that you can point someone to. Now, there are a lot of different ways that you could set up an online resource board. Wakelet is super popular. It's a wonderful one. I was just peeking at some Microsoft education resources um, on a Wakelet uh, yesterday or the day before. So Wakelet's fantastic, especially if you are gathering links from lots of different places and you want to have different collections. You might be more of a Pinteresty person and you might find things on Pinterest that help address some common um, things that, you know, come up. So, for example, maybe you are a coach and you support a group of fourth grade teachers and you know that they're doing something on endangered species, right, as one of their spring units, you might create a Pinterest board full of endangered species resources or online websites great for research and that might be your platform of choice. Or you might create a Google site and have links that go out to different collections of resources. I would suggest that you choose a platform that you might then bring up with your colleagues or with your teachers and say, hey, you know how you always get my resources from here? You could also use this with your students, with your parents, with your families, and make that connection as well. Now, when it comes to online resources and finding things that you're sharing with your teachers, quality versus quantity is really important here. 
right? You want to make sure that you are not overwhelming them with every website that has research on endangered species, right? But that you are maybe choosing the top few that you really want to focus on um, and have that collection that goes along here. So you might go in um, and set a reminder on your calendar, you know what, every six months I have that day that I'm going to go into all of my wakelets. I'm going to get rid of all the stuff that might be a little outdated or not as strong. And then I'm going to reshare out these links to everyone. Now, you might also decide that these are open for contribution. Um, like you might decide that you want other folks to jump in and give you resources to plug in here as well. So if you use a tool that does have open uh, for collaboration, you might invite all the other you know, teachers on a particular grade level to contribute, or you might decide that you are going to have this a little bit more closed, a little bit more specific, especially if you are vetting particular resources. Now, one that goes kind of hand in hand with this is that idea of vetting specific resources and curating content. So when we talk about an open kind of online resource board, you're really pulling together lots of resources. You're checking in, you're making sure that they're good quality, but it's a place that kind of just lives that maybe you have people collaborate on. Um, maybe you're using a, a tool that's already there to build collections, right? But when we talk about curating, we use that word curation, we're getting a little bit more specific, right? We're saying this is something I've handpicked for you. That word curate or curation, I often connect to a museum curator, right? Someone who decides what goes on the wall in which order, right, at a museum so that when you walk through the exhibit, everything that you're presented with makes sense, right? It was chosen specifically to help accomplish the goal of maybe helping you understand, right, the life of an artist or help you understand a period in history a little bit better. And same thing goes here. When we are curating content, you might decide that you want to have a kind of top list of resources where you are getting really specific. Like these are the very, very best ones. I could give you an online resource board with lots to explore, and that might be great for certain times. But if I'm curating content specifically, I really want to make sure I have that top list. So in order to do this, um, you might decide that you are curating this content yourself or you're promoting some ownership and that comes back to this idea of promoting buy-in so that if you have a group of five um, high school teachers, English teachers that you're working with, they're all working on some of the same um, topics with their group of students, right? You might say, I want everyone to give me their favorite resource for teaching uh, Romeo and Juliet. What's the one thing that you know you want to share with students? Maybe it's a TED Ed video, uh, maybe it's a Google Arts and Culture virtual tour of a space, right? Whatever it is, right? Give me your one favorite thing. So that's a way to bring in this kind of top five or curation of content with some ownership behind it. But then you would be the person who would organize everything everything into this special curation or kind of top list. So if you are promoting some ownership with this strategy and you're asking your teachers, maybe you have a 40 minute planning meeting and you're gonna say, you know what, we're gonna spend um, the first 10 minutes. I want you to just tell me your very best resource, send me an email with a couple sentences of how you use it. We're gonna do that right now before we jump into our meeting today. And then you can go in and plug in their content. And I'm gonna show you what this looks like. Um, specifically with Spark Page. Um, I love the Spark tools. I've done some work with their team. And this is one where you can really customize um, this experience of curating content for um, your colleagues. So I am here in Spark. It's a tool I use all the time. And I'm going to create a web page. If you haven't used this before, this has Google single sign-on um, and it allows you to create movies and graphics and all sorts of stuff. I'm just scratching the surface. But for our curation piece today, I'm gonna show you how to create a quick um, web page for a top five list. So so if you are working with a group of your colleagues and they all are teaching about a particular subject, um, you might say, you know what, I'll give that fourth grade example again, right, we're all teaching about endangered species. I would love to bring together five of your favorite videos, websites, online resources you use for research, whatever it might be. So imagine you get those four or five emails from some um, of your colleagues, you would come here to this page and you would put in your title for the resources. I'm going to put in endangered species. For our subtitle, I'm going to put our fourth grade team's favorites. 
you can use the plus sign and choose a photo. Uh, I could type in a keyword like rainforest. In this case, I just want something to go on the background here that's gonna resonate with the group when they pull up this resource. And so here's where you would start combining things, right? You could pull in the text. So you might say, right, Miss Burns has the favorite and then you could just copy and paste everything from the email. So if they gave you uh, one or two sentences of how they use a favorite tool, you could plug it in right here. And then you can put in a button so that you have a link to it. So you could say, right, click here to watch and then you could put in the link to the video that that teacher recommended. So what you're doing here is you're pulling together some resources that are um, ones that your teachers already love are ones that they might not know about because it's a colleague's favorite and not theirs. And you can then get a feel for what some of the missing pieces might be. So if you're looking and you realize that five of your fourth grade teachers all sent you, you know, the same video, well, that's great. They're already talking and they have a favorite thing that they like to share to kick off this unit. Um, however, you might say, I love that I saw this video. Here's a strategy for using it right in your classroom alongside another tool that you've adopted or a way that you could pull this into a creation so kids could make their own movie that's like that video you just shared with them. So this can also act as some fact finding for you and give you an idea of some ways that you might decide to support your teachers um, depending on what it is that they need. So this idea of curating content, um, creating a page full of favorites that your colleagues have shared is great for promoting buy-in, for giving some um, giving some different resources for them to explore as well, but then also giving you a window into what some areas might be that you need to give a little bit more support or some places that you can take you know, that asset and work right off of it. So let's keep going on our list. The next one is to lead with tech. And if you are someone who provides professional development for your teachers, right, you probably do this right all the time when it comes to um, showcasing different things. And so the idea here is to use the teaching tools um, that you are hoping or will be used in classrooms, whether you vetted something and you know it's a good fit for the goals that your school has, you've invested in a particular tool, and then you are able to pull that into your professional development and the meetings that you have for teachers. What's great about this is it gives you an opportunity to incorporate different resources, give a little bit of a quick demo, right, and have them walk away maybe seeing something in action that they've only heard of but haven't participated in. So I always suggest that when you do this, you do it in a way that's not kind of overwhelming, like let me show you all the seven things that I'm really excited about, but you might incorporate one or two different tools, right, in the context of what makes sense for your professional development. So you don't want to do something that's forced because it just shows, right, how when we do anything with technology, right, we don't want to force it. We want to make sure it makes sense. So you might pull in one or two tools and you might use this to share the information that you want to get across during a professional development meeting. Now, if you are leading a meeting, especially one that has nothing to do with a digital learning initiative, or maybe you're supporting an admin and saying, I know you have to do um, this training tomorrow, it's state mandated, here's an idea that I have of how we can incorporate these two tools we're hoping to see more use of, right? We wanna see it for more of a formative assessment in classroom. <laughs> That's our reason for using that particular tool. However, Let's see if we can embed some quick questions or formative assessment like experiences during this um, you know, state mandated training using this particular tool. This way the teachers can see it in action. You might decide depending, of course, you know, logistics are, are challenging when we're leading um, professional development when it comes to time constraints and all of that. You might decide to include a quick demo and then provide maybe five or 10 minutes for your teachers to explore and, partic and participate in a make and take. So what do I mean when I say that? Well, if you are using a tool in a meeting, you might end or pause halfway through, maybe during a half day training and saying, you know what, I've been using this all morning to present this content. I want to show you what it looks like to set up something like what I did today. And then I want you to just take five, 10 minutes you already have logins or sign up here with your school login. And now I just want you to explore, right? Press all the buttons, see what's in there. 
and then maybe right depending on how you are structuring your day you might give some time for a mini make and take so if you are sharing an interactive presentation tool you might show them how you can how they can log in and that this is something your whole district has access to and then give them a chance to poke around and maybe make something that they can take into their classroom now if you are doing k-12 training right so you've got a large range of educators and I often when I visit schools do professional development that's you know just for high school or just for elementary or just for middle school but sometimes I go to a space um, where it's k-12 right so there's kindergarten teachers and high school teachers and sometimes the strategies or the tools or devices you use might not translate really well to both groups so you might pull in two different tools to um, that sort of full day or half day training that you are doing or you're supporting an admin with and then when you do a make and take time giving them a little bit of choice to say you know we looked at this content today, but we also share these two tools. I would love for you to choose which one resonates with you, with your group, with your needs of your students, and then give them an opportunity for that kind of make and take, if you will. Now, when I um, lead trainings, when I'm talking with teachers, or even when I'm you know, doing something with coaches that they're gonna turnkey, I often will use the framework for goal setting of this week, this month, and this year. So if you are working with a group, right, today's Friday as we're recording this, you might say, you know, this week, meaning next week, right, is this something that you are going, what are, what are your plans here with this new thing that we looked at, right? Um, what are you going to try out? Are you gonna make a reminder on your calendar to peek back in? Are you going to try a lesson out right away with your group? What's your goal for this month or this year? And pulling that into your um, professional development that you're hosting as well. Now, as we keep moving through, another um, strategy that can help promote buy-in, that can help um, with you um, really identifying areas that you want to focus in with, with your team of teachers, is a project transformation. And so with a project transformation, we're really zeroing in on something that has always felt pretty good, right? It's something that teachers enjoy, the kids tend to enjoy, but when you really step back and you say, you know what, this is not reaching everyone, this is not going above and beyond in the direction we're hoping for, how can we do a big project transformation? And the idea here is that you would work with a group of teachers, maybe one-on-one, -on -one, right? Maybe um, with a team. This really depends on your particular structure that you have set up in your school or district. And you would identify a popular upcoming project. So you would say, you know what, next month, right, this is the month that we always do fill in the blank, right? Um, it's something that people love to do. Uh, it tends to, it feels like it works well, right, like on the surface level. But if you really step back, you say, you know, there's a group of our students who are having trouble with this or aren't accessing information or this is not as relevant as it was five or 10 or 15 years ago, right? So identify that popular upcoming product project. Examples that I often give when I'm working with groups is something that we all kind of connect to, right? A biography report, a science lab, something kind of general um, that is not super, you know, threatening, right? This is something that people do all over, right? So these are really popular you know, traditional type of projects, so choosing one of those to focus in on, and then, right, reviewing the existing supports. What do we already have that feels like it's working? We already use these rubrics, we already use these checklists, and then deciding how you can bring this together by sharing the value adds from technology technology integration. So you go through this process together to say, this is something we've always done. Um, these are the reasons it feels good. Here are the, res the resources and supports that are in place already. But now if we add on this layer of technology integration, what are some of the value adds here? that is going to take this to the next level, that's going to level the playing field for different students. We can still use the same mini lesson. We can still use the same rubric and checklists. However, we might pull in a particular you know, tech-friendly experience in the midst of that unit of study or as a way to transform a culminating project. So for example, if you're thinking about value adds when it comes to technology integration for a typical project, you might say, well, in the past, this is how we did it, but now I really know that I want students to talk about what it is that they've done, so I need to find a tool that's going to record their voice. Maybe they're going to make a movie, right? Instead of publishing a research paper, they're still going to do all their research. They're still going to have to write paragraphs, but here I'm going to have them record their voice 
to share what their learning is because I know that some of my students perhaps are more confident um, and conversationally proficient in the language I'm instructing in. I know that they're going to find this project more relevant to them if the output, if the thing that they make, their product mirrors the kind of content that they consume online. So when you're talking about this, it's not throwing out a project that everyone loves and feels good. It's really about repositioning this into a transformation so that there's a clear value add from that technology integration. We're not doing it because it's, oh, we bought these Chromebooks and now we have to do everything on Chromebooks. We're doing it because we see this value that's specific to that group of students and the needs that that teacher has identified. So reframing the conversations as much as possible in that way while honoring some of the existing and integrating some of the existing supports um, is one way to consider doing that. So as we keep moving through and we talk about some ways to really um, pull this all together, you might decide to focus in on supporting your teachers by identifying open-ended creation tools. Now, I love open-ended creation tools because they are essentially a blank canvas for customization. So you, instead of using a tool that's just for making one type of thing, right, it's something that is open and has some core features like publishing online, using voice to text, voice recording, image search. So something that you could use for lots of different projects or activities and something that every everyone can use, but it might just be in a different way that they use it. So this is something where you could bring in something that could be part of a conversation in a third grade classroom, a seventh grade classroom, and an 11th grade classroom. One of my favorites um, on open and creation tools, and I've done some work with their team, is um, Book Creator. Um, of course, the Spark tools would fall into that category too, but here's an example of where you can create a new book with students, and there's it's not a tool for making reading journals or math journals. It's not a tool for publishing biographies or science lab reports. Right? It's open-ended and, and depending on what you combine here, um, your kids will make something right really special, right? guiding them through that process. So as a coach, I, introducing open-ended creation tools is really great because you can revisit them over the course of the year and with different groups of, um, different groups of teachers with their specific subject area needs. Now the final way on our list is a tech request and setting up a system that really works for everyone is crucial here. So the idea with a tech request is that you have a way for someone to give you a request like I need this sort of thing in order to make this thing happen or to request support. Now, you might also decide that in addition to this or side by side, you create appointment times to match uh, your schedule. So you might use a tool like um, Google Calendar and set up appointment times and that you make sure that those are not just times that are good for you, but are ones that also align with the times that a teacher might tend to be open in your school. Now when you do this and you are setting up appointments or you are taking in requests for different kinds of support, communicating those next steps and setting expectations for what's going to happen after someone puts in a tech request is really important as well. Now I wanna finish up today with a quote that is one that I've come back to a lot, especially over the past um, week or so. And I think really goes well when we talk about this idea of your role as a coach, um, whether it is specific to the challenges you're facing right now or the challenges that you face every day, even when things do feel um, really great um, in the outside world. But you know, this is hard work that you take on right every day, whether you are thinking about remote learning first and foremost, or you're thinking about your day to day. But this idea of this is hard and we can do hard things is something that I've been coming back to a lot and I thought would be a good way to wrap up this idea of all the ways that you can support um, your teachers as a coach this year. So thank you all so much for tuning in. Um, if you joined a little bit into the presentation, I put this up at the beginning. If you go to my website classtechtips.com slash tech coach con. I have a special Google form there. I'm going to do a giveaway for one of my books uh, today. So if you fill that out before the end of the day, um, I will make sure to get you all the resources.
Thank you so much, Monica. I love that quote that you shared at the end. Um, I think that's really powerful, especially for you know everything that's going on right now in the world. Um, we do have a few questions for the audience. I know you just shared the Google Doc link. A few people were asking if they could have access to that. We will also put that link um, as a typed answer to that question so that everyone, when they go to that Q&A window, can um, get that link uh, right directly in there. Um, one question from Cheryl, she was asking, would a canned response be better than a group email with the information to everyone? So I find canned responses have an opportunity to be a little bit more personal, right? So think of a canned response as I get an email from um, a fifth grade teacher, right? She is wondering what that thing was that I mentioned last week, or everyone's always asking for the help page for a specific tool. You can write a nice paragraph that says, hey, here's where you go for that thing. Thanks for reaching out. You copy and paste that in, but then you put your own personal message that goes along with it. Like, I'm so glad you're finally trying this. Let me know, right? Or whatever it might be um, that's going to help build that relationship at the same time. So canned responses I typically think of as being more one-to-one -one for all those little emails you get over the course of the day that you don't want to have to spend all day writing paragraphs and paragraphs and paragraphs to if you're always saying the same thing. Awesome, thank you. We also had a question from Jeff asking, is there a reason that you use Google Slides versus um, Google Drawings? Um, I like Google Slides because I find it to be really shareable for when you have like almost handouts that you're giving to someone, right? So I like it from, I love Google Drawing. There's wonderful reasons why I use that tool. But for this, I like it because you're really setting up almost all of these sheets, if you will, that you would typically print out in a way that everyone can access all that old stuff, even if you rip it off of the side of um, the bathroom's mirror. Awesome. Um, okay, Dr. Sean Coffrin asks, how do you determine the best way to reach out to a teacher who is struggling with technology? What is the passive or indirect way to reach out without making it feel like it would be, I would be invading or being too overbearing? It's a great question. I think, yeah, I think just the fact that you've acknowledged, right, that you don't want to come across as being too overwhelming or too invasive, right, is huge. And that's a big first step for something like that. What I would do is I would try to be as much of a listener for as long as you can be for that person and try and identify where your in is going to be. Like, what's their pain point? What's that thing that they're struggling with, right? So instead of saying, hey, can I come observe you all week, right, maybe say, hey, can we, um, grab, can I bring you coffee during your prep and we can talk about um, some things that are maybe hard, feeling really hard and then just doing more listening than suggesting so that you can focus in on just maybe one thing or two things and then say which of those two things um, do you want to spend a little bit more time on together and then provide that hey I'll promise I'll check in by this time and then have that sort of um, consistency with follow-up. Awesome. Um, so we are going to do two last questions. First from Sarah. Um, I'd love to know what tool you can use to create your tech request for setting appointments with the tech coach. So if you want to do a um, kind of a calendar sign up, I use appointment slots within Google Calendar um, because I'm in the Google ecosystem, right? I'm happy and familiar in that space. So when I do that in Google Calendar, instead of setting up like an event, I set up appointments. It's just another option on the drop down menu. And what then happens is you can share a link to your calendar. And that way, someone will only see when you have open slots, they click on it, and it sends you an automatic invite and it takes that slot away so no one else can grab it. There's other tools like Calendly. There's some other ones that um, have free or paid um, versions, but many of them integrate with Outlook. So if you're using Microsoft or integrate with, um, with Google Calendar, but you can do it right within Google Calendar if that's your go-to. Um, Sarah asked a follow-up question. Is there a way to customize those appointments to match a school schedule? So you would be the one who decides when your appointment block is. So if you know, for example, that the best time to meet with teachers in your school is between 11 and 1, and you want to make sure you keep those meetings to about 20 minutes or so, or 25 minutes, maybe it's virtual, right, or maybe it's face-to-face, -face, um, you get the option to customize what that looks like. But you, the reason I mentioned that idea of really honoring the schedule is so that you're not making your only availability when like everyone has something mandated, right? Sometimes we don't think about that when we're so worried about getting our things organized. So it's just a good reminder. Perfect. Um, okay, last question from the audience. Um, 
Sheetal, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. Hi, Monica, I'm an ICT teacher. Um, I'm gonna botch this school name, but from Jambai Narsi International School in Mumbai, India, welcome. Um, I teach primary students grade one through five. Could you suggest me a way which I will which will provide to me different learning and teaching. So when we talk about this idea of, um, of like differentiating within a particular group, especially within elementary, uh, I really like looking for tools that kids can use that are going to let them show what they know in different ways. So especially ones that allow them to record their voice or to give voice to text responses in addition to text responses because then you can differentiate the way kids are responding to a prompt that you might give them. Um, so if you have an kind of LMS or a content management system set up, you might also decide to group students within, say, a second grade class. So when you are pushing out activities to them, you can send it out in a differentiated manner, even within one group. Wonderful. I know differentiation is so important, especially um, you know, as students are in new learning environments. Um, well, we wanted to thank you for presenting today. A few people have also asked if you'll be sharing um, your presentation resources after this, um, either by link or email, um, if you wanna share that information and any other information um, to kind of help get the word out about things that you're working on. Absolutely, yeah. So if you filled out that Google form um, on my site, I'll make sure that you all have that too in case you want to share it out. I'll make sure to send out the list of tips for today so that you have that in your back pocket, some links to some of the things that I mentioned, and I'll also do a giveaway of one of my books. So you'll see a big email come through um, at the end of today, and if you're watching this as a recording, you can still request it. Um, I have my Google form set up, so it just lets me know if someone else um, popped in there afterwards. But thank you all so much for having me today. Uh, for this special event.